Hi and welcome back to another video of Medic Notes. This video will be on Hydati Deform Mo. It is defined as an abnormal pregnancy, characterized histologically by trophoblastic proliferation and also edema of the villus stroma. These are the risk factors of Hydati Deform Mo, which includes maternal age, either less than 20 or more than 40, defective fertilization, previous history of gestational trophoblastic disease, previous history of Hydra T deform mole, and studies have shown that there are higher risks in women which are having blood groups A and AB. There are two main types of Hydra T deform mole, which are the partial mole and complete mole. So I have listed over here the differences. So partial mole, there will be fertilization between two sperms and one egg, whereas in complete mole, the egg is empty, plus one or two sperms. Hence, for the second line, the chyot tapping, partial mole will be triploid, whereas complete mole will be diploid. The triploid in partial mole consists of two sets of chromosomes from paternal origin and one set from the maternal origin, whereas the diploid in the complete mole is only paternal derived. The maternal chromosomes are absent, so hence it will result in no viable fetus, as the placenta develops into an abnormal mass of cysts. So, in partial mole, the embryo is present but usually dies early, and the fetal red blood cell and fetal parts are present as well. Whereas for complete mole, there is no embryo, no fetal red blood cell, and no fetal parts. So if you look at the beta HCG level, the elevation is only a bit in partial mole, whereas it is very high in complete mole. For malignant change into choreal carcinoma, it is rare in partial mole but it is higher risk in complete mole. So looking at the clinical features of Hydra T deformed mole, the symptoms include amenorrhea, hyperemesis gravidarum, irregular vaginal bleeding, excessive uterine enlargement, passing of hydropic vesicles vaginally, which look like cluster of grapes, and also hyperthyroidism features may be seen in hydatidity deform mode, which includes heat intolerance, loose tools or diarrhea, rapid heart rate, warm and moist skin, hand tremor, and excessive weight loss. For the signs we can look for are also signs of hyperthyroidism, high blood pressure, and on abdominal examination, the uterus is larger than date, doffy in consistency, cannot feel for any fetal parts in complete mode, absence of fetal heart cell in complete mole, and they might be palpable ovarian mass, which we call tecalutin cysts. And also look out for signs of secondary metastasis. The investigations that we can do, first to confirm the pregnancy, pregnancy test, which includes urine pregnancy test, where it will be positive, serum beta HCG level, this is not only for diagnosis, but also for prognosis later on. For blood tests, full blood count to assess the hemoglobin level and there might be anemia due to bleeding. Thyroid function tests to assess the T4 and TSH levels to exclude hyperthyroidism since there might be hyperthyroidism features. Liver function tests to exclude liver metastasis and also assess the liver function as the patient might be started with chemotherapy and most of the chemotherapeutic drugs are metabolized in the liver. Renal function tests also to assess the kidney function as the chemotherapy drugs are excreted by kidney and they are potentially nephrotoxic. We can also do group cross-match and group self and whole around 2 to 4 pints of whole blood before doing suction and curettage. For imaging tests, it is abdominal or transvaginal ultrasound. It is used mainly to rule out an intrauterine pregnancy where there is absence of embryo or fetus. And in hydatidiform mole, we will be able to see cluster of grapes or snowstorm appearance, shown in this picture over here. It's like a honeycomb appearance. We might see fetal part, which may indicate partial mole. If absent fetal, might indicate complete mole. Theca lutein cysts may be seen, and there will be absent fetal heart sound. Another stage of investigations is to assess for any metastasis. So 
So chest x-ray to exclude lung mats, ultrasound of the abdomen and also CT scan and MRI to assess the extent of the disease. For management, the main management is to do dilatation, suction and curettage under ultrasound guidance. And this procedure preserves the fertility of the patient. After this dilatation, suction and curettage, we have to repeat ultrasound after one week to check if the molar tissue is still present. If it is still present, consider to repeat the suction and curettage. Counseling and follow-up and also serum beta HCG monitoring in outpatient department. So regarding the follow-up, during follow-up, we should determine the serial quantitative beta HCG levels and monitor weekly until it is undetectable for three consecutive weeks, then monthly until undetectable for six consecutive months, and then two monthly for the next six months. This is to make sure that the beta HCG levels are going down. Any rise in the levels should prompt a pelvic examination and also further evaluation for persistent gestational trophoblastic disease or any metastasis. Also, women are advised not to conceive until their HCG levels are normal for at least 6 months. This is because if they are pregnant, it will also cause an increase in the beta HCG levels. So it will be difficult to detect whether the high HCG levels are due to pregnancy or due to persistent molar disease. We can also offer contraceptive for 2 years after treatment. And the best method is barrier method, which is condom. And if the patient doesn't desire for any childbirth anymore, it can do sterilization. Oral contraceptive pills should be used after beta HCG level have reached the normal level. That's all for this video. Thank you.